In May of 1836, the United States House of Representatives adopted what became known as the gag rule to prohibit any discussion of the hundreds of thousands of anti-slavery petitions that women, as well as some men, were sending to Congress. This was supported by representatives from South Carolina and Tennessee, and the gag rule stood in opposition to the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, which reads, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. At the time in 1836, Representative John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts objected strenuously to the gag rule, arguing that it directly violated the constitution. But the House of Representatives adopted the gag rule in every Congress through 8 December of 1844, when Representative Adams finally succeeded in organizing enough votes to repeal it. Now, for decades since the nation's founding, petitioning Congress was a common form of men's political engagement, especially because many men at that time did not enjoy the right to vote. Men and women petitioned local and federal lawmakers with individual or personal requests, usually regarding pensions for military veterans or their survivors, and also to address regional and national issues, things such as transportation and war. So the gag rule took aim specifically at anti-slavery petitions, which notably were submitted usually by women's organizations. In the 1830s, white women and free black women formed local anti-slavery societies to protest the institution of chattel slavery in the United States, and also to assist those enslaved people who had managed to escape. In the early 19th century, of course, white women and free black women didn't have the legal right to vote and were also barred from participating in politics. And of course, over 2.5 million enslaved women and men were legally defined as property, not as persons. And so they didn't have the right to vote or participate in politics. So for free women, free white and black women, Using the right to petition Congress was a way to make their voices heard in the national debate and conflict over slavery. Women's petitions presented their arguments against slavery in terms of morality. They argued that the institution of slavery was cruel and immoral. They deliberately and strategically positioned themselves as advocates for morality and for humanity. And they framed their petitions as appeals to educated and enlightened men. That is, they didn't petition by positioning themselves as the intellectual or social equals of men in Congress. Instead, they argued that as women, they had a moral obligation to speak out, to petition Congress, to protest the institution of slavery, to protest the buying and selling of enslaved Black people, to protest the expansion of slavery into the Western territories. For example, in the constitution of um, an organization by the women of Salem, Massachusetts, the Salem Female Anti-Slavery Society, these women wrote about their anti-slavery work saying, we sh will share these views with the world. We will stick to moral arguments, not political actions. We know these don't make real change, but God knows that it is all we are allowed to do. But anti-slavery women did make change. Of course, it was their petitions that prompted the institution of the gag rule. But they were not opposed. Oh, sorry. See, oh, golly, we got to do this all over again, Layla. Sorry. It's OK. Do you want to start um, from the very can beginning? I, or I, I oh, wanna... can I start from there and you can edit it? Yeah, I can do that. Oh, that would be perfect. OK. Yeah, if you uh, want to start wherever the sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be great if I don't have to read it all again. OK, so right, the <laughs> Massachusetts Female Anti-Slavery Society, we don't make change. God knows it's all we can do. Of course, women anti-slavery activists did make change. Their actions prompted the imposition of the gag rule. But anti-slavery women were opposed to the gag rule, and they were not deterred by it. Anti-slavery activists, white and black women and men, regarded the gag rule as an effort by powerful Southern politicians who supported slavery to suppress the rights of those who opposed slavery and to stifle debate. Women continued to submit their petitions to Congress. 
In fact, in 1838, a group of women from Brookline, Massachusetts, submitted a petition to protest the gag rule. They wrote that the gag rule was destructive to the principles of government, to the rights of minorities, and ultimately to the well-being of the United States.